All right, question eight. So there are 10 people in a lift. These 10 people have a mean weight of 79.2 kg. Okay, so this is so far 10 people included. Now it tells us that three of these people get out of the lift. These three people have a mean weight of 68 kg. So it's way less than these guys. Work out the mean weight of the seven people left in the, in the lift. So these seven people must have a weight way bigger than the av total average. Now, how to work this out? So this kind of question, we always use something known as the weighted mean equation. Yeah. Now the weighted mean equation is so nicely written. So the way it works, we have a first group. So let's split these 10 people in two groups. Yeah. We've got group A, which is three people and group B, which is seven. So let's just label it A and B. Now to write an equation, we can say that of these three people, group A, they have a mean weight of uh, 68 kg. So this is A time, plus times the mean weight of A. Plus the group B, which is seven people, have a mean weight of, I don't know, let's just call it M, so MB. And it must equal the total number of people, which is 10, and its total mean weight, which is 79.2. So quite straightforward. So you've got group A times its mean, plus group B times its mean equals the total group, everybody times its total mean. Now, as you can see, all we got to do is literally find the value of MB. And to do it, just make MB the subject. So what I do is just multiply this out. So you go first things first, three times 68, that's gonna give us 204 plus, this will be seven, let's just call it seven M, equals 10 times that, 792. Now to make M the subject, just subtract 204 across. So you've got seven M equals that minus 204. Yep, I can't be, uh, so you can put this in the calculator. And then lastly, divide that by seven. And when you divide your final result by seven, should get a total mean uh, a mean weight of 84 kg and this is the mean weight of group b and that's it guys that's literally done okay guys number nine is my absolute favorite kind of question you can get yeah i'm sure you guys love these too so let's quickly rush through these so part a simplify t to the power nine divide by t to the power three so when you divide you subtract the powers so you got nine take away three which is six so it's t to the power 6. Next one, simplify this. w power 5 times w power 7. When you multiply, you add the powers. So 5 plus 7 is 12. w power 12. Last one, simplify 5xy squared, all of it cubed. Now when it says this, you literally just attach a power of 3 to everything. So 5 gets a power of 3. x gets a power of 3. And since 2 is already attached, you, you just stick it with a 3 as well. So this becomes 2 times 3. So now this total result, you've got 5 to the power of 3, which is 5 times 5 times 5. Or in the calculator, 125. X to the power of 3. And then 2 times 3 as a power is 6. That's it, guys. That's literally wrapped up. All right, 10. So change 22 meters per second, okay, to a speed in kilometers per hour. All right. Not too bad. So they want us to ba basically go from meters to kilometers and then and change seconds to an hour. Okay, let's do the meters first, yeah? So for meters, we need to know firstly that there is a thousand meters in one kilometer. Since we've got 22 meters, just to make your life easy, divide by a thousand. So it's gonna be over a thousand kilometers. Likewise, for the second components, uh, we know there is, so this is kind of a trick. You need to go from seconds to minutes, minutes, hours. We need to know there is 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. In other words, um, there's going to be 60 times 60 seconds in one hour. Okay, it's just basically, if you multiply this, because you have to go two steps, seconds to minutes and then minutes hour, and you have to go 60 twice. So this means there are basically 3,600 seconds in one hour now because it's per second this means that one second is is its inverse must be one over 3600 hours so therefore to finally convert we can see that 22 meters per one second is the same as using our conversion 22 over a thousand kilometers per uh, 1300 hours and then that's literally it and then putting this exactly in the calculator just literally don't write kilometer you can't write km or h in the calculator put this in a fraction in a double triple fraction 
and you should get a, a direct answer of 79.2 kilometers per hour that's it guys that's what we do okay 11 so some three years ago the ratio of tom's age to clemmy's age was two to seven okay keep that in mind ratio of tom's age to clemmy's age was that ratio now tom is 15 years old so three years later tom is 15 years old and clemmy is now x years old find the value x all right so the way this works we need to kind of go back to the first statement using info from the second so let's go back three years ago yeah we know at this stage the ratio of tom's age to clemmy's age was two to seven in terms of actual numbers we know that three years ago tom must have been 12 years old yeah since he was 15 three years later and since clemmy was x years old at in that timeline three years back she must be well x minus three literally that now this is all the info we got so to get the value x what i would do is just ask myself what is like the scale factor between 2 to 12 and 7 to that well to get from 2 to 12 we know we can multiply by 6 and because ratio is like fractions you've got to do the same on both sides so you got to times this by 6 to get that result so in other words using tom's age this means that 2 times 6 must give us 12 that's correct as for clemmy this means 7 times 6 must gives us x minus 3 so now we just got to solve this equation and we're done so 7 times 6 is 42 that's going to equal x minus 3 and then just add 3 across you're going to get 45 so 45 must equal x and this is the age of clemmy right now okay number 12 so we're given a pressure which is equal to a force by area so this is a formula which we usually have to memorize a box in the shape of a cuboid is going to be put on the table. The whole of one face of the box will be in contact with the table. The force exerted by the box on the table is always 105 newtons. So this is our constant force here. So that's covered. So this part is 105. Oh, 105. Okay. The box has dimensions 5 by 4 by 3. One, qu one quick note, guys, yeah? Because we're dealing with area, we don't want the volume. So what it's trying to say is that because we're dealing with one whole of a face, yeah, we just need the area of one face, one of the sides. So in other words, we can say like five by four or four by three or five by three, for instance, yeah. That's all we need. So the greatest pressure exerted by the box on the table is P newtons per meter square, and the least pressure is Q. Work out the value of P minus Q. In other words, the difference between the greatest and the least pressure. All right, so all you have to do is basically work out what the greatest pressure is, the least pressure, and then subtract them. So to get the greatest pressure, so let's say uh, it's P, right? It's going to be the, the force, which is 105, over the area. Now, the area depends, so we need to think about what would give us the greatest value. Well, to get the biggest value, you need to get the smallest possible denominator, because a big numerator divided by a small denominator will give us a really big answer. If this value is big here, then you're going to get a smaller result. So the smallest area I could think of would be 3 times 4. Okay, when you do that, you should get a result of 8.75. Okay, so this could be the greatest pressure. Now for the least pressure, again, the force is constant. It's going to be something with, which has the, the, a bigger denominator because the, the closer the values are, the smaller the result. And the biggest value I could think of would be 5 times 4. So 5 times 4. And in doing that, you're going to get an actual pressure of 5.25. So notice how, how this works, yeah? You chose a smaller value, you got a larger pressure. You chose a larger value here, and you got a small pressure. Makes sense, yeah? It's like, it's like, it's like comparing the top and bottom. So therefore, the value of P minus Q would just be this value, take away that value. And subtracting those two, you should get uh, 3.5. And that's it. Just leave your answer there. All right, 13. So on the Venn diagram, shade the set A uniting with B, or the complement of A uniting B, intersecting with C. All right, let's take our time with this here. So A uniting B means all of A and all of B. So essentially means this area here, uniting with all of B. Now, however, complement meaning is everything outside the circle. So actually, it won't be all of this. Will be everything around it outside a and b so basically something like that 
Okay, now it's saying that this segment is going to intersect with C. So what I'm going to do is get another color and shade C. And then we're going to see what they both, what, what is actually being overlapped. Well, looking at the diagram carefully, the only thing being overlapped is actually this small segment here. It's got red and purple. So this would be our actual final result. So everything outside this can be removed. Yeah, and that's it. So just shade, so basically just cancel all of this and cancel this red marker here. Yeah, usually with these kind of questions, I always recommend using two different colors, yeah? I know in the pencil, in the exam, you only have, you can use black, but what you could do is use a pencil and, or maybe try different patterns, you know, do stripes like this for one, one, sec, one segment, and then maybe like this direction for the other element and see, and see what intersects. Okay, let's move on to B then, yeah? Okay, so use set notation, so hold on. Use set notation, describe the shaded region in the Venn diagram below. Okay, all right. So I had some thinking of this one. So what it looks to me is that, it looks to me that F has got the better deal. F has got three elements shaded in, but if you look at the perspective of D, only these two are shaded. But if you look in the, in the perspective of E, again, only two is shaded. So what this tells me is that we should focus on F um, intersecting with the union of D and E. Because if you unite D and E, as in one, so this would be D uniting with E, and then you just pick F on its own, you can see that actually everything seems to be line up. I mean, this part all completely intersects with both purple and orange. So, and that's just F by the way. Yeah? So we can, so, so, this, so this notation is literally just F uniting with D and E. That's it. That's, oh, no, 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 not united, sorry. Intersecting because it's a common element. Intersecting with D and E. Yep, and that's it, guys. If you've got any questions with these problems, let me know. I should have um, quite a few different worksheets on this, yeah? Have a go and um, let me know what you guys think, yeah? All right, number 14. So each day that Barney goes to college, he either goes by bus or he walks. The property that Barney will go to college by bus on any day is 0.3. When Barney goes to college by bus, the property that he will be late is 0.2. But if he goes, if, but if Barney walks to college, the property that he'll be late is 0.1. Complete the tree diagram. All right, so they've really done one of us, which is 0.3 for bus, meaning this must be 0.7. So for every single tree, it must always add up to one, yeah? Now let's look at what they're talking about for the second line here, the second paragraph. So apparently, when Barney goes to college by bus, so he takes the bus route, the property that he will be late is 0 0.2. So this would be here, because this is the late tree. This means that property he won't be late must be 0 0.8. Because remember, they must add up to make one. Likewise, if he walks to college, so we're taking the down route, the property that he will be late is 0 0.1. So that's here. Meaning not late must be 0 0.9. So that's it. That's just easy two marks bagged. Now, Barney will go to college on 200 days next year. So in other words, forget that. Work out an estimate for the number of days Barney will be late for college next year. So notice it's talking about specifically being late. It doesn't tell you what method he's using, yeah? So the only way to be late is that if you catch a bus and be late or you decide to walk and be late. So the property of, of these things happening, well, you just follow the tree. So if you're going to be late through the busway, it will be 0 0.3 times 0 0.2. Multiply these two, you can get 0 0.06. But if you decide to walk... And then be late, it's going to be 0 0.7 times 0 0.1, which is 0 0.07. So meaning the total probability of actually being late, you just add them up, is going to equal 0 0.13, yeah? Now, this would be cool. This usually is the end of the answer, but it tells us that he's going to do this for 200 days. In other words, you're going to, you've got a 13% chance of being late over 200 days. So let's multiply 0 0.13 with 200. So 200 times 0 0.13, this means that he's going to probably be late for 26 of the days. That's it, guys. That's um, done. Tree diagram's done.